inspiration. Some spend a lifetime searching and never find it. But some do find it in the sky. I noticed the other night I was looking west and I noticed the, as the sun was setting, it was yellow orange where the sun was. Right outside their window. So I looked at that deer and I felt the moment in a way that I haven't felt in years it seems. In untamed land. I like to define nature as more than what uh, is out there that was there a thousand years ago. Throughout history, nature has spurred artists, writers, and thinkers to recreate its beauty and learn from its unending wisdom. To photograph truthfully and effectively is to see beneath the surfaces and record the qualities of nature and humanity which live or are latent in all things. Ansel Adams. Nature, I'm so lucky to be able to work in nature. So incredibly lucky. It's almost like uh, meditation in a sense. It's almost like a, it's almost like a prayer in a sense. It's almost like a spiritual experience for me to be able to grab the moment and capture it. Jim Brandenburg is a legend in the world of nature photography. He worked for the National Geographic Society for 30 years and has published numerous books. His job has taken him to the farthest reaches of the globe to photograph the most timid of animals in impossible locations and capture facets of cultures not understood by the Western world. Many people ask me about my images and how they come about. And oftentimes I really don't know it goes way back in my childhood of a certain kind of impassioned story that I want to tell, very deeply impassioned. And, and I've thought about this for years and years and years. It seems like when I head out with my cameras, I'm trying to show nature the way it might have been before we came. Although structure and preparation are keynotes of his shots, his fame came from an unplanned opportunity. I remember one time I was in North Dakota working on a story and I was having lunch. This is 30 years ago almost now. Pull off the side of the road in this beautiful slough and the wind was blowing as it does in the Dakotas in western Minnesota and the reeds were bent over and there was some algae on the water, it was golden and the reeds and everything was, was really beautiful, but it was noon. So I just sat there eating my lunch and I saw, all of a sudden I saw this tern, this sooty tern, it's kind of a blackish bird that was, was playing the wind back and forth. And I looked at that picture and I said, well, it's noon, so I'm sure it's not a very good picture. Just that's conditioning. So I stuck my 600 millimeter lens out the window right in my car and I just started shooting this, this tern. And that's probably a pretty good example of kind of serendipity. I edited the film and I went out east on my first big tour to the magazines, National Geographic and Audubon Magazine. And that was the top picture that got me a job at the National Geographic. And it was this little North Dakota afternoon, sitting in my car, just kind of sensing something that's I don't know what that was, it was just a sense. The richness I achieve comes from nature, the source of my inspiration. Claude Monet. Uh, I like to define nature as uh, more than what uh, is out there that uh, was there a thousand years ago. And I, I think most artists are affected by nature to a certain degree at least. Charles Beck has been a well-known and respected artist for decades. He lives and works in Fergus Falls, Minnesota. A tree juts through his deck 
and a bridge leads to his front door. I've heard artists have said to it, saying that I want to paint, but I don't know what to paint, you know, and it, they, it's, it's a kind of tragedy because uh, uh, being interested in what I'm interested in, there's never a, a uh, lack of uh, subject matter because, of the, again, the, the area that we live in here and the seasons and so on. When you start out with something, you have an idea of what you want, and if you don't get that, you feel it's a failure, and you fail to see something that happened there that might be as good as what you wanted or maybe even have more potential. So uh, you've got to uh, leave you a little uh, room for imagination and uh, change. And uh, I think any time any person that writes music or uh, books or uh, poetry or anything will write a piece and then leave it for a while and then look at, at uh, look at three months later when his, his mind is fresh and he, has, he sees it in a different light. He peels slivers of wood from the back of an old plank, then rolls paint over it. Slowly, what looks like simple grooves becomes something much more complex. See, the white here is what I carved out of the wood. A farmhouse. A field. A row of trees. The autumn leaves. Everyday objects reborn through abstraction. The fall is more variety and color and more exciting in color, so I go out and do little oil paintings. I'm sitting in my pickup, and now and then I get somebody to stop by and wondering if I'm having problems. And uh, I tell them, I'm having a problem, but you can't help me. And uh, sometimes some will stay a little longer, and this one farmer, he looked and, oh, you're painting my farm. I, I think I was doing some of the buildings in there. And he, he looked and looked, and it was just silence, you know, and he didn't know what to say because he didn't like what I was doing because I don't copy it, you know, at all. And, and I said, I kind of broke the ice and made him relax him a little. I said, well, I'm only a beginner. Well, he said, I can see that. <laughs> the shapes, textures and colors of Minnesota's birds stimulate Beck to bring them to life in 3D. I've always been interested in working in three dimensions, but I've never been, uh, had, didn't have a subject that I cared about. I didn't really care to do people. And so I started doing a few and um, uh, it led to uh, interpreting most of the kind of birds that you'd see around here. I don't I do it unless it's something that I've seen around here. Like, there's all kinds of things in nature that have things that have color, textures, shapes, and uh, structures that uh, give you an idea how to break up space in your painting. It's somehow just the relationship between two colors. You might see in nature something like a tree and maybe the ground in front of it. And say, there's, a, there's an exciting relationship between uh, two colors, three, four colors together can uh, create a, a feeling in you that's uh, kind of exciting. Famous writers have penned timeless stories and poems about the beauty that surrounds them. So low for long, they never write themselves. You may see their trunks arching in the woods years afterwards, trailing their leaves on the ground. Robert Frost. I think for me, it's uh, uh, picking up messages that uh, both people and the natural world uh, seem to put out, <laughs> give to me. Uh, so, though I must admit there are moments when, bang, a line will appear in my head. So, wherever that comes from, I don't know, maybe it's from just being observant, maybe it's from uh, another world, I don't know. Larry Wywoody is an acclaimed writer and professor. The actual word means in breeze, uh, inspired, and usually it meant that uh, some god or the spirit, Holy Spirit, was breathing into a person's brain the words they wanted that person to produce. He grew up in North Dakota, but his career blossomed in New York City. He moved back to North Dakota to be closer to nature. I'm not exactly sure what I would do without nature uh, because it, it does feed the senses. Um, and if I receive inspiration, I think it's from nature. I do, yes, there are instances where reading another person will spark thoughts in me. 
but that's different from seeing something entirely original. Nature actually, you know, in a sense is infinite. I mean, you can always find something new in it. Uh, we know that, you know, that's grass, but we know that below the grass there's, there's bacteria and other layers, and below that there's living things, and on and on. I just look around at it and see what's going on in it and take that in. And uh, somehow it seems to teach me something. Uh, slow down, be patient. Uh, I've been here for 60 years, a tree says to me. Uh, and I might say back to it, so have I. Why Woody, who is North Dakota's poet laureate and winner of the state's highest honor, the Rough Rider Award, wrote a poem about the official state tree, the American elm. In this case, an elm that is dying. Venerable elm, convener and celebrant of every everyday breeze disheveling your shade, rocked by amber thought, syrup flung in stringy yarn toward carved scars, torn stems, and the needlepoint of stars. Gulping ground whiskey, drunk in the sun, assuming quaking poses and slurred susurrus to provoke busybody birds. Provender to rooters above and below, raccoons and moles, and leaf miners and borers and ants attuned to your whiplash scenes and spooky phases. Plus, woodpeckers rattling inside you in red rages. No nodding, new growth at this, your last leaves as far from you as the rose printed on my camo cap. Oh, multitude of one, Lakota dancer, stilled by a lightning hit. Shedder of shade to the ages, its proof incised in inner rings. Now I, my chainsaw crying, blue as the sky, I must dismember you. Now more than ever, society is being distracted. Some people don't even think of nature. And although it's a priority for many, it is losing its bearing in society as a source of happiness and relaxation. I feel that young people are so plugged into audio and video and Facebook and all those other things that they can't receive anything from the natural world anymore or they're, they're getting to the point where they can't, and that's too bad, because you can learn a lot of things from nature. If you ask me, what is your biggest surprise in your 64 years, it would probably be that people, some people spend their whole lives without kind of feeling any kind of rapture towards nature. When I'm talking about nature, I'm talking about primal nature, you know, prairie grass or or uh, something that's native, that's evolved here. And there's so many people that go for days, weeks, months, without ever spending time alone on a log out in the woods, or go for, go for a stroll on the prairie, and run the prairie grass through their fingers this time of the year and have a whole bunch of prairie seeds that have been here you know, since the glaciers left and <laughs> blow them in the air. And, I don't know how people can survive without that. I'm a geology major and a botany minor, and I uh, find that pure science is just too uncreative and dry for my liking. For every handful of people migrating indoors and online, there are some, even of this youngest generation, who are trickling outdoors and bucking the trends at the University of Minnesota Biological Station. This is so gorgeous. Located in the heart of Itasca State Park in central Minnesota, students from around the country learn about the wild in the wild. In fact, it's advertised as one of the wildest classrooms in America. The students really bond together, as you can see. Excellent. From, I mean, they, they didn't know one another before they got here. These landscape architecture students are learning how to preserve, protect, and restore natural landscapes while exploring a bog.
This macro photography class is capturing the flora and fauna of the region. Hummingbirds are a good subject to choose for an introductory photography class because they're very challenging. They are very fast. You can't document aspects of them without good technique. And so I like to let students attempt to photograph them just using the basic camera setups. The wildness part comes in, I think, in that you are seeing nature as is in its wild form. It can be unpleasant to be standing in the bog and getting wet, but after you've seen all of the neat biology out there, it's what brings you back. It's the wildness, the closeness to nature. It's what makes Itesk uh, very special. Look deep into nature and you will understand everything better. Albert Einstein. Americans have been inspired by nature in their state and national parks. Chad and Tasha DePlaces have been to all but three of Minnesota's 71 state parks and recreation areas. What started eight years ago as a way to see Minnesota's waterfalls has turned into a hobby of epic proportions. That was kind of like, that's how it started, was there's all these waterfalls in the North Shore, so let's go see them all. <laughs> yeah, and and we saw them all, and then we're like, oh, these are awesome. Then we started branching out in the southern part of Minnesota. The parks are providing their children with unique opportunities to connect with nature. It started out with us just hiking. And then it started with canoeing and kayaking. And now we've really gotten into biking, where just this past summer, I think we went on five state trails. Photo albums filled with hundreds of photographs document their every trip. Snowshoeing in northern Minnesota. Sliding down the thickened ice of a waterfall. Turtles spawning near a lake cabin. There were six turtles, and they came into that yard, and they were laying, and they were laying eggs. It's about peace and quiet and just stopping to notice the details. Like, if we are always racing around in life, which I tend to do <laughs> as a teacher, it's really nice to just get out of the rat race and soak up some sun, get some exercise, and notice the little things. For me, it's like the tiny little frogs that we saw and stopping to pick them up and check it out. There's so many cool things that you just wouldn't see otherwise. And for me, it's kind of like a religious reflection kind of. I like, I mean, it's a great place to, to just be thankful and to pray and just be at peace. Study nature, love nature, be true to nature. It will never fail you. Frank Lloyd Wright. Brandenburg lives in something akin to a state park. He calls it Ravenwood. I'm so lucky to have a square mile of property in the Ely area, out right next to the Boundary Waters, and I can go out there in 365 days of the year. There may be two or three days of the year I see someone out, and I become very agitated. Not angry, but just confused. What's that person doing here? So here's the contradiction. I want it all to myself yet I want everybody to be out there doing it. If everybody went out in nature now, we wouldn't have any wild areas left. Well, I'd probably rather have that. I'd rather have the Boundary Waters just, just full of people with noise all over the place. And then our culture would be better off for it than, than I think nature would be. If there is a happiness in nature, I think nature would be pretty happy too. To forget how to dig the earth and tend the soil is to forget ourselves. Muhandis K. Gandhi. For some, nature fills their hearts and minds and guides their hands. I don't have very many green ones in here, but uh, they do make green ones. It's called Green Envy. It's a nice chartreuse green. I just absolutely love it. I'm inspired by nature all the time. In the gardens, if you really 
take the time to listen, they will tell you what you need to do. Holly and Barry Mobby own and operate Garden Dwellers Organic Herb Farm in Church's Ferry, North Dakota. The Mobbies grow flowers, some vegetables, and herbs on land where houses once stood. Husband and wife work side by side, breathing life back into a land left barren from a federal buyout. They welcome tourists passing through to stop by and lend a hand. Sometimes, pressure from owning a business can make one lose focus. There have been times I've been out here uh, weeding away and, and I'm hot and I'm tired and I'm thinking, why am I doing this? And all of a sudden I'll come along a, a little toad, you know, in his hole. And it just reminds me that if I, if I were to slow down and I do this organically, when I could run out and, and get a whole bunch of chemicals and not have weeds, but I do it organically because of the toads. It's hard to think of a deeper connection than the one between a farmer and the land. Don't think they're quite ripe yet. You know, you can't tell on a grape by color. You know, a lot of people think, oh, if they change color, they're ripe. Grapes aren't like that. They really have to come into their own um, flavor in their own time, and color doesn't have a whole lot to do with it. I don't... Mm. Not quite ready yet. Soon. There was another time I was up weeding um, the theme gardens, and I had something rolling around in my head, you know, a little problem from the day. And the more I weeded and the more I worked, the more worked up I got about it. And all of a sudden, this big shower of pink came down around me. And I happened to be weeding under the flowering crab at the time. And, and this little breeze had come up and blown a, a bunch of the petals off. And they all just kind of fell around me. And it's like, okay, I get it. Let it go. <laughs> I can't do anything about it. You know, the little problem in my head. I understand. Let it go. Inspiration is something that moves you from within. It's not an external motivation. It's an it's a internal motivator. It's something that doesn't need an end product. It's totally personal and partially spiritual and moves you to be better, be greater, or do better and do greater. And, and I think that's what inspiration I think is to me. It would seem that a career full of prestigious accolades would be the ultimate end product. But for Brandenburg, who's had that experience, giving back to nature and his community is the highlight of his career. Probably my greatest reward is, is going back, full circle, back to my home in Laverne, having traveled the world for National Geographic and other magazines. I've come full circle and I've applied the photographic legacy through the Brandenburg Gallery in Laverne to actually preserving land. We preserved 800 acres of native tall grass prairie, unplowed prairie in Rock County with the help of Main Street Laverne and the Fish and Wildlife Service. I might add this year was one of the greatest thrills in a biological sense in my whole career of anywhere in the world. I was walking out on Tuchesky Prairie late summer and came upon some fringed orchids, some native, extremely rare orchids that grow not too far from the Moorhead area, I think just to the south end of the North Dakota side, I believe. An extremely rare orchid grows on the prairie, the prairie fringed orchid. I found several plants and it was one of the most ecstatic, talk about rapture in nature. Uh, it, was, it was something that, that may not have happened if we hadn't preserved it. I'm not sure where the plants came from, if they've always been there. It was almost like seeing an apparition. Uh, so rewards on top of rewards. So it's, it's a personal story and a, and a park preserve that we all can enjoy. It belongs to the people now. And our goal is to make it bigger and we'll just see. But it comes from that elusive thing of inspiration, making pictures, 
having a feeling, having a belief system about nature, photography, creativity, and it's nice to apply that and now having a legacy that my great, 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 great grandchildren and all my friends' great grandchildren and the rest of the public can walk out and enjoy. Nature has given life and inspiration to us throughout the centuries. Many have been spurred on by this inspiration. We must take time to soak in the gifts of nature. And in turn, we must use these gifts to create, to educate, and to preserve nature for future generations. Great Spirit, the star nations all over the heavens are yours. And yours are the grasses of the earth. You are older than all need. Older than all pain and prayer. Great Spirit, teach us to walk the soft earth as relatives to all who live. I need your strength. Great Spirit, whose voice I hear in the winds and whose breath gives life to the whole world. I come before you as one of your many children. Grant me to walk in beauty that my eyes may ever behold the crimson sunset. May my hands treat with respect the things which you have created. May my ears hear your voice. Make me wise that I may understand what you have hidden in every leaf and every rock. I long for strength, not to conquer others, but to conquer myself. May I ever come to you with pure hands and candid eyes, so that my spirit, when life disappears like the setting sun, may stand unashamed before you. <laughs>